of science, or we'll talk about something in biology. Games for arbitrarily fed pets. Thanks. It's too bad that my late parents couldn't hear this because my father would have enjoyed this introduction and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> uh, thanks very much to Doron for inviting me. And uh, I would like to dedicate this talk to the memory of a dear friend, Professor Herb Wilf. And I would like to recognize the presence of his wife, Ruth's wife, there at the end. And she is accompanied by my uh, wife, Shola. And I see here some other friends like Neil Sloan. And uh, I just met uh, Nathan Fox, who works on very similar uh, directions in combinatorial game theory, and also together with uh, Urban Larson. So uh, let's see what we will uh, bring up here. Okay, okay, the slide of numbers. So, in kindergarten we learned about the integers, the piano axioms, <laughs> and then in grammar school we learned about pairs of integers which form the rationals, and then uh, in high school we learned about dedicated cuts which form the not real United, numbers. Not in the United States. <laughs> not in the United States. <laughs> Maybe in a different country. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, at this stage we all know about those things, and th these are three, uh, three uh, steps of learning about the numbers. Now, Verlecamp Conway and Guy, especially Conway, discovered and promoted a powerful method, and uh, Don Knuth called it surreal numbers that creates all those numbers in one stroke, rather than in three consecutive steps. And together with those numbers, it also creates something called games. And um, so now we have all these things together, and we know all of them. However, there are some bad boys, some bad numbers that don't behave quite so well. Uh, so we might assume that it's the rational, perhaps the subset of the uh, transcendentals. But no, it's really bad boys are <laughs> rationals that sometimes present obstinate difficulties. And uh, I had the occasion to talk about it with Doron when he recently visited in Israel. And here's an example of uh, what happens with the rationals. So suppose you have a sequence here, the, the, the king of the sequence that sits here, Neil, um, but this is a finite sequence. Uh, alpha, one, alpha, they're distinct real numbers. And we call them moduli for the purposes of this talk. Um, there is a 45 years old conjecture that states that there exists three numbers gamma i, such that this system, the integer part, which the one doesn't like so much, the integer part, uh, n alpha 1 plus gamma 1 and so on up to n alpha m plus k. gamma m, where n goes uh, over the first two integers. This cost, constitutes a complementary system of m sequences. If and only if these moduli have this particular rational form. By complementary system I mean that uh, pairwise these systems are uh, disjoint and their union is all the positive integers. 
why is this an interesting conjecture that many people worked on? Um, let's see. Um, so first it says here is that for certain number, certain offsets gamma i, the system is indeed complementary. But there are also other gamma i's that do it. Um, the main open problem is the uniqueness of the distinct alpha i. As I said, other gamma i will also do it, but nobody knows if there are other distinct alpha i that will make up a complementary system um, if m is at least 3. For example, it is known that two moduli have to be equal for integer moduli. Integer moduli, these are essentially arithmetic sequences. So take the even and the odds, 2n and 2n minus 1. So the moduli 2 are the same, 2n and 2n minus 1. You can take, if you like, 2n and 4n minus 1 and 4n minus 3, then you have two fours, and so on. So uh, there is a, a proof from the book that shows that these uh, two moduli are the same, but the proof from the book um, uses, everybody knows what the proof from the book is, right? Um, uh, uses uh, generating functions and complex numbers, and uh, it's very simple, but it doesn't really give you much of an insight why they have to be the same, the two largest moduli. And we found uh, later on um, an elementary proof, but it's much more complicated. And independently, my friend Jamie Simpson from Australia also found elementary proof at about the same time. And the reason you want m bigger than or equal to 3 is you want to avoid bt sequences. Because we want? You want to avoid bt sequences, which is um, you get with disjoint That's pair. right, that's yeah. right, that's, that's right, because bt sequences for m equals 2, they can, uh, they are in fact, they must be different if they are irrational. Um, when they are rational, of course, in the homogeneous case, uh, they, they cannot be disjoint, but, uh, but they can be in the inhomogeneous case. And we have some characterization of uh, how these offsets have to look. Um, now, um, as it says here, for irrational moduli, Graham showed that also two, not necessarily the two largest one, but two have to be the same. And as you pointed out, Neil, uh, that holds only if when m uh, is at least three. Therefore, I have the constraint that m is at least three. Many people worked on this conjecture. At the moment, the best... Um, and the conjecture is due to Frankel. You should say that. Yes. And the... Uh, a uh, best known result uh, uh, for, uh, for at the present is that for uh, when the number of sequences is uh, at most seven, then the conjecture is true, but nobody knows what happens for eight. And I have some idea on how to, uh, a recent idea on how to, that actually came from by preparing this talk to, uh, some approach to check for larger sequences. And in my humble opinion, this approach is a win-win um, approach in the following sense, that it either produces a counterexample or it shows why it's very, very unlikely uh, that there, uh, that there is a counterexample. So I talked about that with Delon recently. And uh, just uh, last week I talked about that with Ron Graham, who uh, also uh, is a 
did some things in these uh, directions. Okay. Um, now we come to write of games, which uh, Nathan uh, Fox uh, has, uh, has some results on, on, on related uh, subtraction games. So there is uh, an integer parameter t, and two players alternate in removing tokens from two given piles of tokens. There are two possible moves. Um, either you can take from a single pile, so you take at least one token, and you might take even the entire pile, or you take from both. And, but if you take from both, then uh, say k from one and l from the other, then the difference in absolute value must be less than t. And um, it's what we call the normal play. So player loses if unable to play when there are no tokens left. So uh, when t is equal to one, that's the, uh, actually the original right of game. Then uh, um, the move to assert that the same amount has to be removed from both piles. So uh, we define second player winning positions, commonly called P positions. P stands for previous player win. And for T equals 1, they look as follows. 0, 0 is a P position because by default, the first player can't do anything, so the second player wins. Now, when you have uh, run two, that means a pile of one and a pile of two, then also the second wins. Why? Because if the first takes the one, then the second can take the two. If the first takes one, one, then the second can take one. And so you can see all the possibilities the second player can win. And more generally, the P positions look uh, look like this. Uh, I mean, the first few is a zero, zero I omitted here. And uh, can you see some, uh, um, so people like Neil, I'm sure, can see how these, uh, um, he knows how these uh, sequences go on, and how they are. Can you see some uh, rule except for, uh, for, uh, Nathan and Neil, the two ends here, mm -hmm. Neil and they look, Nathan. They look almost linear, like the, it seems like the different sequence has something. Like what? The different sequence seems to have like a periodicity. The, the sequence of, of consecutive differences. Oh, differences. Yeah. So what's Bn minus An? Oh, I don't know about that. Oh. Okay. I ask you, what's Bn minus An? I can't see here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, it takes whoever said n, that sounds right. <laughs> Pn minus n is n. It's easy to see. What, what actually are a n and d n? I mean, what are those numbers? What do they are? Those the, the these are the pile, pile sizes. Okay. The pile sizes. So, so like, one, two is a second player win, <coughs> similarly 3-5, and so on. These are all second wow, player okay. wins. And um, so it's easy to see what Bn minus An is. But the question is, what is the next An? Um, 17. So, uh, so we were just in a hotel in, uh, where were we last? In what hotel was it? In, uh, what? Jake Howard. What? No, something with in. In, what uh, was it? In uh, Penn State. So in Penn State, uh, there was a restaurant for breakfast, and there was some, oh, I forgot to bring it here. Uh, it said late mix. <laughs> um, <laughs> it seems to me, I asked uh, the bartender and he said it's the name of a restaurant. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, AN, so A11 is the max of these numbers. What's the max? The minimum excluded. The least number, <coughs> least integer that didn't appear before. 
So in this case, um, A11 will be 17, because it didn't appear before. And then, uh, and then B, uh, B11 will be easy. It will be uh, uh, 17 plus 11, 28. But so the AN uh, is a max function. That makes these sequences complementary. Um, so it's a recursive algorithm, and this provides an exponential game strategy in the input size log x, y of any given position x, y. I don't know why. Oh, why this rectangle appeared here. Anyway, um, and the question is whether there is also a polytime uh, strategy. So uh, here we see uh, uh, again that the rationals are shown. So uh, we start with some irrationals, alpha and beta, uh, alpha um, satisfying this uh, equation, 1 over alpha plus 1 over alpha plus t is equal to 1. So that means that alpha has this expression here, and let gamma be alpha plus t. Then uh, it turns out that the p position that were before defined recursively, they have also an explicit uh, expression, namely given here by the integer part of n alpha and integer part of n gamma. And that provides a polytime um, uh, polytime strategy. Um, and these are complementary sequences because 1 over alpha plus 1 over gamma is 1. This gives you the right, um, uh, the right, uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, well, like uh, when you take 2n and 2n minus 1, which we said is the, uh, it gives you the right density. For 2n, 2n minus 1, 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 is 1. This is certainly a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. But for the case of irrational uh, alphas, uh, alpha and gamma in this case, it's also uh, um, it's not only necessary, but also sufficient. Um, all right. Um, also, other generalization of Generalizations of right of are invariably associated with irrationals. Rationals are shunned. Um, in uh, honor of uh, Nathan Fox, I also um, give here a enumeration a strategy based on enumeration system. So. Uh, we expand alpha into a simple continuum fraction, and then the numerators of the conversion satisfy this recursion. And every positive integer has a unique representation in this form, dn, sum of dn, pn, where the digits um, di satisfy this inequality. And there is an additional constraint, namely that if di has its maximum value, then its right-hand neighbor must be zero, because otherwise you get uh, two representations. And uh, here's an example for alpha equals 1, 2, 2, 2, which turns out to be the square root of 2. Then uh, p0 is 1, p1 is 3, p2 is 7, and so on. Try to remember these numbers, 1, 3, and 7. These are the first uh, numerators of the uh, conversions. So here is a strategy based on a numeration system. So for t equals 2, the p positions look like this. Here again you see bn minus an is this time twice. N. 
In general, it will be t times n. Before we saw the case t equals 1. And now here is the numeration system, which I turned around a bit. So remember the 1, 3, 7. These are like the powers of 10 in the decimal system or powers of 2 in the binary system. 1, 3, 7. So 1 has the representation 0, 0, 1. You have to turn around these uh, columns here by 90 degrees clockwise, and you get the numbers. And 2 is 0, 0, 2. And 3 is uh, 0, 1, 0, because it's 1 times 3. Yes? Do you follow the... Okay. Now, can you see some... Uh, what are the AN numbers in the representation and what are the BN numbers in the representation? Can you see some rule? Yes, you see it. Yes, Neil, explain it to us. <laughs> it looks like when the, you get the, um, if you look where the zeros are. Where the zeros are? So, uh, that's not the entire story, but it has to do with the zeros. So, the ANs are all the number whose representation ends in an even number of zeros. Remember that zero is even. So, for example, one. One appears in a n. It's the first entry in a n. And the representation is zero, zero, one. It ends in zero ones. Similarly for two. But three ends in a odd number of zeros, so therefore it's a BN. And 4 is again ends in an even number, and similarly 5, but 6. 7 ends in two zeros, so it's again an AN, and so on. Moreover, there is a left shift property. So, uh, is there any choice? Right in that. No in the box. In the box. What, in, in the, the box? In the box. Uh, to the right of the computer. Uh, oh, thanks. So, take zero, zero, 001. Take a left shift. Become zero, 010. Zero. So this is 1 and this is 3 in the representation. So one, three are a pair. Now take two, zero, zero, two. Make a left shift. It becomes zero, two, zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, two, six is a pair. Take four, zero, one, one. Shift it left. It becomes one, one, zero. So four, ten is a pair. Okay, these are uh, sort of basic properties with this uh, representation. And this also uh, gives you, it, it, it produces uh, a, a polytime strategy. Now, we are here to rescue the rationals. And uh, so beginning the investigation on rational sequences, uh, properties of one containing the other and so on, but not complementarity, are due to scholar Bang, they were Norwegian mathematicians, and uh, their uh, papers, some of them are given in Ivan Neumann's book, Der Fantan Approximation. In previous work, we considered rational complementary systems and rational right of type game for small m. And in the present work, we extend our work on rational subtraction games to arbitrary, arbitrary m uh, bigger than or equal to two, arbitrary number of piles, to remind you. And in particular, formulate, formulate effective game rules for games defined only by the sets of p positions. 
which are second pair in position. So maybe it's something similar what you are doing, Nathan, in the sense that you are given P positions and then you are looking for game rules. Uh, well, I'm not quite sure that it's... You are looking for, for the case of uh, aperiodic... Uh, um, a periodic uh, candy. Uh, yeah, it's, on, it's only one pile, but you look yes, at the quantum only one pile, right? You're only looking for people to Only change. one pile, right. Um, so now here is a secret. Arbitrarily fat in the uh, title means arbitrary uh, number of piles. And that stands for rational. <laughs> So it's not biology. So, uh, um, so here are red games. So we define uh, little numbers, uh, in this case rational numbers, 2 to the m minus 1 over 2 to the m minus k, where k goes from 1 to m. Remember that these are the moduli from the conjecture, you remember? Um, and gamma, gamma, are the offsets. These are offsets, uh, the integer values, there are other gammas as I pointed out before. And so the p positions of our game, uh, they are also called let, they are here defined in this form. This is uh, all, uh, um, these are the, the partitions that, and the conjecture was that these are the only um, moduli that are distinct that partition the positive integers. And uh, yes, we remarked that these partition the positive integers. Now we see game rules for game G whose P positions are the reds as given here. Um, so in seeking the game rules. So we have to know what the moves are. And uh, so any move will do, except uh, something we call inadmissible, namely those that connect to P positions. You see, P positions are independent. The P position is a second player win. So whatever uh, the first player does, he loses. That means that uh, that uh, every option from P, every every move from P lands in an end position. N is the next player win. Whereas from any end position, there is at least one P follower. And if you want to win, then from N you go to this P, because from P the other guy doesn't have any chance but to go to N. And then you go from N to P, and if there are no cycles, then like in this case, and everything is finite, then the N guy will win and the P guy will lose. So there's also a Hebrew translation, N, the Nitzachon, P, the Fitzfus. All right. Um, so uh, notice that for any game from P, there are only moves to N. This is what I just said, I think. The set of all first player wins since P is independent. And roughly a subtraction game, here's another notion, is invariant. If every move can be made from every game position, provided only that the result is a non-negative vector. So invariance gives a certain measure of robustness to a game. There, the move doesn't depend on the position you are in, but there are sort of like universal rules for the moves. And uh, so uh, here is a lemma that states there's an admissible move from every m-dimensional position, not in P, to a position in P. So from N you can always go to P. 
And so uh, for every number of tiles, at least two, 